It looked like my father, my, my grandfather was White Crane, six foot three. Huh? It looked like Boy George. <laughs> Try to teach to me. Try to teach me, tell me. You know, some guy, some pirate, which I found out later, 18,000 miles off his course, discovered America. Huh? Ask questions about that, no teacher could ever answer. So that's how this movement, this movement came about. And we knew we had to change the name, the acronym, Concerned Indian American Coalition. That's CIA. <laughs> so we put out the word to the people. We didn't want, Clyde Belker didn't name it, Dennis Banks didn't name it, the American movement. We wanted people to name this new organization. Three weeks later, two elderly women came in I said, Mr. Belford, we'd like to talk to you. So I went outside with him, you know. They said, why don't you call your organization AIM? Why? Well, you're aiming to do something about police brutality. You're aiming to do something about the dual system of justice. You're aiming to do something about the foster care system, you know. You're aiming to do all But what does it mean? She said, American Indian Movement. Oh, I said, oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're not going to call ourselves Indians anymore because some pirate was 18,000 miles off his course. And that elderly woman grabbed me by the shirt. She said, listen here, Sonny. Indian is what they use to oppress us, and Indian is what we'll use to gain our freedom. I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. Let me go, you know. That's how we got our name. That's how this movement came about. One of the most powerful movements to ever exist here in the Western Hemisphere and perhaps the world came about. That's us. And because we knew that 75% of all the energy resource was on our land, because we knew where I come from, 90% of all the fresh water left in the Great Lakes area comes from our land. And because we said that we'd never give up another inch, another ounce. With just three years, in just three year period of time, J. Edgar Hoover developed a COINTELPRO program to infiltrate Martin Luther King, infiltrate the black Muslims, Malcolm X, infiltrate the black men, infiltrate the National Organization of Women, even had the women on this list, they had to be infiltrated, disrupted, destroyed. He even had a sentence in there, if everything else failed, they had to be neutralized. You know what that means? It means a bullet in the head. It means what happened to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and others in these great movements. Just three years after we made that statement, we marched on Washington, D.C. with the 20-point solution paper and took over the BIA. Just three years, J. Edgar Hoover had us number three on his top ten hit list to be destroyed and neutralized if necessary. That's how powerful. You know, this guy was a weirdo. You guys know about J. Edgar Hoover? He used to go home at night and he'd go home at night and put on his pantyhose. I'm serious now. Read about him. Oh, no. He put on his panio and he had a big high chair and he sat there and a little light on his old bulldog in the corner and he would devise ways and means on how he's going to get rid of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, National Organization of Women, Symbionese Liberation Movement. And in there he had the American Indian Movement listed. We became the number one threat to the stability and the security of the United States federal government. Read Clarence Kelly's book, Who Succeeded, G. Edgar Hoover. We became the number one threat to the security and stability of the United States federal government. In Munini in 1973, for the first time in history, they brought in all the military forces. It's illegal. 
You've got to have congressional approval and presidential approval to do that. You can't bring in military force anywhere in the world without congressional and presidential approval. And if they're going to go into Iraq or Afghanistan, which they're talking about now, it takes them years. They've got to build up public support. They've got to say they have weapons of mass destruction, they're building hydrogen bombs. They've got to get public support to do that. But Moondini, the second morning, the first morning we were there, they hauled me out. I come out of the church basement where I was sleeping. They gave me a binocular, and I started looking around, and there was 24 armored personnel carriers surrounding us. My brother, Lenny Foster, my nephew, was there with us. And as we were observing all that, here comes these jets. About 200 yards up in the air shake you right out of your feet. That same afternoon, they came with a big gunship and they dropped leaflets on us. Told us to get the women and children out there by five o'clock. They're gonna come in and get us. Not one single Indian woman, not one child. Even the church leaders inside Wounded Knee would not leave that village that day. That's the power, that's the strength that we developed at ceremonies every day. Everyone that came in had to go through the purification lodge, had to purify themselves. Every time we had a feast like we had today, we had to pray, we had to sing, we had to dance. And at the end of the day, we had to give thanks. We had to have Thanksgiving. We didn't wait for Abraham Lincoln to declare the last month, the last Thursday of the month of November Thanksgiving. When the American movement started, we started having Thanksgiving every day of the week. Because that's the way it was at one time. We couldn't go fishing, we couldn't hunt the buffalo, we couldn't tap the maple sugar tree, we couldn't harvest the wild rice, we couldn't even plant a garden without asking for direction from the Creator. We couldn't do anything. We had to pray to Mother Earth to give us forgiveness for taking that fish, taking that blueberry, taking that maple syrup to feed and take care of the people, take that medicine. We had to ask her for permission. And when the harvest was over, the fish were in and the buffalo, we had Thanksgiving. And we gave thanks to the Creator. We gave thanks to our Mother Earth for providing for us. Every movement, every chapter, every time Indian people sat down as they did today, don't forget that. Put a spirit plate together all the food that your loved ones like to eat, everything that's on that table, everything that's going to be served, make a little spirit plate. Pray, take that out. They like Thanksgiving too. Take that out, put it out there for them. They're still with us. All those that have left us, they're still with us. We still live the spirit of Crazy Horse and Geronimo. We still have the spirit of all our grandmothers all of our leaders within us. That's where our strength comes from. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. When I came home from Wounded Knee in 1973, about a week later, there was an assassination attempt on my life. I was shot right below the heart with a, a 38 dum dum. A dum dum is when they take the lead and they file it flat and they put an X in it. So when it hits you, that bullet goes four ways. It blows you apart. Early in the morning, I was shot with a 38 dum dum. They wanted to get rid of me because I'm the speaker of the house. They want to shut me up. Like Martin Luther King and all the other great leaders, they wanted to shut me up. I went on that, that road, that road that our grandfathers and our spiritual leaders talk about when you leave this land, when you go home. I went on that road early in the morning when I was shot. I remember the pain, the terrible burning sensation within me. I ran for the door and I was running for the door. Lenny, others that woke up, heard that shot, saw the guy trying to empty his gun on me and it jammed on him. 